Hello friends, in this video we will be talking about three editorials which came in the first week of January. The first editorial is titled Creative Curbs and it deals with freedom of expression. Let us first look at the outline of the article. Recently, the yet to be released movie Padmavati has been under serious controversies. This article takes up this particular issue and looks at it from a societal point of view. The article focuses on external pressures on creativity which could have several consequences and one such consequence is self-censorship and self-suppression. The article also deals with the reasons behind such external pressures and in the context of this particular controversy the author notes that this external pressure is because of our social inability to tolerate a creative rendering of history and our deep-rooted patriarchal mindset. Finally, the author concludes this article by asking a question about what happens when there is a tug of war between creative conservatism and artistic freedom. Let us first look at the external pressures on creativity. The external pressures on artistic ideas can come in different way, form or shape. If we take the movie industry in particular, there is so much of money involved in it and since it has a lot of commercial value, the commercial stakes for such artistic creations are high. So when pressure is applied on them to change to censor or to alter certain sequences, the movie makers usually given in order to get the movie released. All it looks like is a practical adjustment or even a fair compromise to get the movie released. But the problem is, because they are giving it to such pressures, this practice of changing the creative thought is implicitly encouraged. So, such pressures on creativity will only increase rather than decrease in the future. Is this scenario only present in India? Absolutely not. Because in 2009, when Inglorious Bastards, an English movie, a Hollywood movie was released, the movie makers decided to alter the spelling of the title simply to avoid being explicitly offensive. There are several consequences for such external pressures on creativity. One such consequence is self-suppression. What is the meaning of self-suppression? It is the exercising of control over what one says and does, especially to avoid criticism, which has what happened in the case of the movie Padmavati. But you have to understand that self-censorship is not necessarily because of external pressure. Sometimes what happens is it can also occur in order to conform to the expectations of the market. So a movie director or a movie director might want to please the audience in some way. So he might include certain elements in the movie which will actually increase its commercial value. What the author is saying is that in either way, self-censorship is likely to get the better of free expression. What she says is because of this self-censorship, the creative thought is restricted and it is impeded. It is in this context that the author of the article notes Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of United Nations, which guarantees freedom of speech from all forms of censorship. In the context of the controversy around the movie Padmavati, the author highlights two key societal issues. One is our discomfort in tolerating free expression. The author says that this issue shows our inherent discomfort and inability to deal with creative interpretations of history and reality. The other issue is our patriarchal mindset. The author observes that this story supposedly gives primacy to the woman at the center. But the movie title has been asked to change from Padmavati to Padmavat. And also the external pressure groups have raised objections to the queen shown dancing without a veil. This shows the regressive mindset that we have in our society right now. The author says that all of this is a reflection of our patriarchal mindset. The author concludes the article asking one simple question. Where does artistic freedom go in the face of such increasingly strident conservatism? Now let us look at the second article which came on the 4th of January titled Behind the Enemy Line. Let's first look at the outline of the article. This article is about the ceasefire violations which has been happening along the line of control in the Kashmir region. We have an idea about what is happening from the Indian side. The author of this article has actually travelled to the other side of the border into the Pakistan occupied Kashmir and has analysed the dynamics of ceasefire violations from the Pakistani perspective. In this article, he deals with the dynamics of the region on both sides of the border, the ceasefire violations and their repercussions, three mechanisms to reduce tensions on both sides and the need for confidence building. Now, before we dive into the article, let's try to understand the geography of the military stations in that area. Muzaffarabad and Ravlakot are two brigade stations. 
Muri and Rawalpindi are headquarters. If you look here, here is Srinagar and the line of control is around here. In this map, we have a detailed description of which part of Jammu and Kashmir is held by whom. Now, Muzaffarabad is the capital of POK and the headquarters of 1 AK Brigade. Note that AK here means Azad Kashmir. The part which we refer to as Pakistan occupied Kashmir is referred to as Azad Kashmir by the Pakistanis. And Ravala Court is the headquarters for 2 AK Brigade. Muri is headquarters of General Officer Commanding of Pakistan and General Headquarters is present in Rawalpindi. Now that we have a perspective on the commanding centers and military geography, the author now tells us about the impact of ceasefire violations on the Pakistani side. Like in the Indian side, there is so much of destruction of lives and livelihoods on the Pakistani side as well. This rampant use of high caliber weapons leads to civilian casualties and the destruction of their habitats. Also, whenever there are ceasefire violations, it gets difficult for the children to go to school. The author observes that all these stories are tragically similar on both sides of the border. Having said that, the author tries to understand the vulnerabilities of the Pakistanis in the Pakistani side of border. First of all, there is far more border population on the Pakistani side than on the Indian side. So, there is an asymmetric impact of ceasefire violations on the Pakistani side when compared to our side. From the military aspect, the author says that the military deployment on the Pakistani side of LOC is actually thinner than that of the Indian deployment. Moreover, they have not erected border fences, stationed fewer troops, constructed fewer posts and carries out very little patrolling. All of this shows that the Indian forces enjoy sheer physical dominance along the borders of Pakistan. So what are the repercussions faced by Pakistan? The Pakistani army is under a lot of pressure from the local population to control the firing. So, there is greater enthusiasm in Pakistan for confidence building measures, including formalizing the 2003 ceasefire agreement. But the problem with implementing confidence building measures is that the political classes and civilian bureaucracies on both sides of the border show very little interest in compared to the military personnel on both sides. In the next part of the article, the author talks about three potential confidence building measures. The first step lower the caliber of the violations, which means the two sides should consider withdrawing heavy artillery to 50 km behind the zero line. The second step is that the two DGMOs should consider holding regular meetings every six months because it has been observed that every time the leadership of the armed forces meet, ceasefire violations go down. And the third step is establishing more flag meeting with points between local commanders. This leads to better communication, reduced misunderstanding, thus resulting in fewer ceasefire violations. The author finally concludes the article by saying that just because the Indian side suffers fewer casualties and lesser destruction of civilian habitats, we should not avoid entering into joint mechanisms to stabilize the borders in Jammu and Kashmir. Hi friends, I am Manoj Prabhakar from Smart Leaders IAS. Today we are going to have a brief look into an editorial that appeared in uh, January 4th in a Hindu newspaper. The tutorial was on uh, first draft of NRC released in Assam. What is NRC? NRC. NRC is National Register for Citizens. Uh, uh, the National Register for Citizens contains the names of the citizens of India. Assam is the only Indian state to have NRC and it was the first, in fact, it was the first Indian state to publish NRC after 1951 census. Uh, subsequently, the NRC of Assam was not updated and there was uh, serious issues of illegal immigrants into uh, Assam because of his uh, porous borders with Bangladesh. Now they have decided to curb the issue of illegal immigrants by updating NRC. On what basis the NRC is going to get updated? First, uh, the names of the person or their descendants who appear in NRC 1951 or the names of the persons or their descendants present in electoral rolls up to the midnight of 24th March 1971 or the names of the persons or the descendants present in any of the admissible documents issued up to the midnight of 24th March 1971. This is the brief outline of NRC. Now let us look into the issues that led to the updating of NRC. In 1979, the issues of illegal immigrants was burning in Assam. 
So uh, Assam, all Assam Students Union uh, uh, organized a protest against the problems of uh, the menace of illegal immigrants. And the protests went for six long years. And in 1985, Assam Accord was signed between the central government and the ASU, the All Assam Students Union. In 2005, the tripartite agreement to implement Assam Accord was signed between the ASU, state government and the central government. And in 2009, Assam Public Works, an NGO, they filed a case in Supreme Court uh, to initiate the updation, updating NRC. In 2017, Apex Court set a, a deadline for the state government that before 31st of December 2017, the NRC has to be updated and the draft has to be published. Uh, the author of this editorial feels that the NRC draft which is published uh, recently, it is not a draft by itself. It uh, looks like a draft of drafts. There are lots of shortcomings in the NRC draft. What are the shortcomings? Of the 3.29 crore applicants, only 1.9 crore names are uh, present in the NRC draft. Uh, approximately 1.39 crore names are under scrutiny. This means that huge number of names missing out is, has created panic among the public. So uh, the government is taking some measures to cut down the panic and to reduce the anxiety of the public. The huge number of names missing out in NRC is a clear case of a good number of illegal immigrants in Assam. The process was initiated to completely curb the vex vexing issue of illegal immigrants. But with the huge number of names missing out, the problem is not going to end. That's what the author feels. The question of NRC has evolved from being a simple question on deciding, one uh, deciding the citizenship of a resident of the state to it has evolved into a multidimensional question. It has posed problems from different directions. First, in the uh, humanitarian side. See, the cutoff date is fixed, as, uh, uh, fixed in the year 1971. After, uh, we have around uh, three decades passed over. What is the situation of the people who have been living in Assam and to their descendants? Almost, it, it would be somewhere around three, two to three generations of people would have been living there in Assam after 1971. What are we going to do with them? The second point is, before 2015 Assam election, the election commission had marked 20,000 voters as doubtful. So uh, there is no clarity over those names. And uh, most of the illegal immigrants are suspected to be uh, from Bangladesh. And uh, if at all we have identified the illegal immigrants and, are we are, and we are planning to send them back to Bangladesh, we don't have a proper deportation treaty with Bangladesh. This is going to jeopardize our repatriation efforts. Also, uh, the image which is being displayed in this uh, slide shows the uh, protests organized by the Assamese people against the provisions of Citizenship Amendment Bill 2015. As per Citizenship Amendment Bill 2015, any minority coming from Bangladesh, Afghanistan and Pakistan can be provided with citizenship in India. So uh, the people are doubtful about this uh, citizenship bill and they are, uh, they, are, uh, they are up in arms against the Citizenship Bill 2015. First way to move ahead is we have to seal the India-Bangladesh border effectively. The second way would be to have uh, special work permits for foreigners in India. The government should uh, ponder upon these two ideas to cut down the menace of illegal immigrants. Thank you for watching the video. Please subscribe to Smart Leaders IAS YouTube channel for further updates. Thank you.